Hello class, this is Miss Augustine. We are still in chapter 14 talking about chemical periodicity. So we'll start talking about electron configurations. Remember each group on the periodic table has the same ending electron configuration. So everyone in group 1a ends with an s1, everyone in group 3a ends with a p1, and everyone in group 8a would end with a p6 configuration. So the position on the table tells you its electron configuration. So remember that the group number is giving you the electron configuration where the row number is indicating the highest occupied principal energy level. So the highest occupied principal energy level is equal to whatever period number, and remember periods are the rows. So example, calcium is in the fourth period, that means the highest occupied principal energy level would be n equals 4. So remember on our block diagrams, the first two columns are the S block, S1 and S2, and then uh, the P block was where P1 through 6 fill in, and then here's the D block where the transition elements are, and the F block are the inner transitions. So groups 1a and 2a, the electron configuration ends in an S sublevel, and the highest occupied energy level would be equal to whatever row or period number you're in. So again, calcium would end with 4s2 since it's in the second column of the S block. The P block, groups 3a through 8a, are where the P sublevel is filling, and again, the highest occupied energy level would be whatever the row number is. So silicon ends in 3p because it's in the third uh, row of the periodic table. And then the D block is where the B so-called transition elements are, and the electron configuration ends in a D sublevel. And again, the occupied D sublevel always has a principal energy level that is one less than whatever your row number is, because remember, the Ds fill in after the S sublevel. And then the F block, the so-called inner transition elements, or inner transition metals, the F sublevel is being filled in, and remember that that F sublevel is going to be two less than whatever the row number is. So if you're in row six and you're in the F block, the four Fs are filling in, two less than the row that you're in. So again, uranium in uh, period seven has seven minus two is five, the five Fs are filling in. So there are important trends that we find that we will follow and those are radius, ionization energy, electronegativity, and metallic character, and I will define them one at a time. So let's start with radius. The atomic radius is what you would expect it to be. It's the same radius that you learn about in math class, but it's defined as half the distance between the nuclei of two atoms in a homonuclear diatomic molecule. So remember that chlorine exists as Cl2, and so if the nuclei are here and here, then half that distance is the atomic radius. So as you travel down a group, the atomic radius generally increases, and if you think about it, the electrons are added to higher energy levels, so they're further away from the nucleus, and they're also um, layered. So each time you add a new energy level, you're adding a layer. So as you travel across a period, the atomic radius generally decreases, and that's because if you're on the same row, you're not adding any new levels of energy levels. And so you're adding electrons to the cloud, but you're adding protons to the nucleus, and that increased charge in the nucleus, because the nucleus is so tiny, it tends to pull the electrons in closely. So the trend is less pronounced as the atoms get bigger and bigger because of something called shielding. And what is shielding? It's the fact that inner electrons protect the outer electrons from the charge of the nucleus. So as you add layers of electron cloud, and it's all negative, they're going to be farther from the nucleus, and they're going to be shielded from the pull of the positive nucleus because of the layers of electrons.
So again, if you look here at this portion of the periodic table, and you can see as you travel down, you've got all of these layers, kind of like an onion if you cut it crosswise. You've got all of these layers, and the nucleus is at the center. So again, what I'm showing you here is as you're moving down, you're going from one layer and then it's getting bigger and bigger until finally when you get down here at the bottom, there are many layers. And again, this is showing you the P's and the D's and the F's. So as you go across a period from left to right, radius decreases, and these are examples. And as you go from top to bottom in each row, it gets larger, so it increases. So here is a graph. We will hopefully do a lab where we look at the changes in radius with atomic number. So this is atomic number. So here you have hydrogen and helium, and the radius is fairly small. And then when we start a new row, look at how much it's changed. It's bigger because, again, when we get to lithium, we've added another layer, and then it decreases down until you get to um, the next. So this would be sodium, and then this would be whoever comes after sodium. I can't remember. Potassium. So as you see here, it's getting bigger as you move across, and the trend gets a little bit less obvious as you uh, get to larger elements. So the ionization energy is defined as the energy required to remove an electron from a neutral atom to form an ion. And so the first ionization energy is how much energy it takes to remove the first electron, and the second ionization energy would be how much energy it takes to remove a second electron, and at that point it would be an ion. As you travel down a group, the ionization energy decreases, and if you think about it, the atoms are getting larger, it's easier to remove electron, and as they get larger, those electrons are farther from the nucleus, so it's easier to pull them off. As you travel across a period, if you remember that the radius decreases across, that means that they're held more tightly, so the ionization energy increases. So as you move across a period and the um, radius decreases, it takes more energy to remove an electron because of the greater nuclear charge. And so ionization energy increases up and across. The more stable an atom is, the harder it will be to remove an electron, and elements that become more stable by losing an electron have generally low ionization energies. And this is what ionization energy looks like, so hydrogen to helium, then you start a new row, it's low, and then it increases across. Start a new row, it's low, it increases across. So let's remind ourselves about what ions are. Ions are charged atoms. They have different numbers of electrons and protons because when you're neutral, when you're neutral, you have the same number of protons and electrons. So cations are positive, and that means that they have less electrons than protons because they've lost electrons. And anions are negative because they have more electrons than protons. They've gained electrons. So the next trend is electronegativity, and that's the tendency for an atom to attract electrons to itself when it's bonding. And so it's expressed on the Pauling scale. It's kind of like uh, the power of an atom. The stronger the atom is as far as nuclear pull, the higher its electronegativity number would be. Noble gases, since they don't need to gain or lose electrons, do not have defined electronegativities. So as you go down a group from top to bottom, as the atom is getting bigger and bigger, the electronegativity decreases. Again, that's because of shielding. The pull of the nucleus is not as strong. Transition metal, electronegativities, um, and other properties are not as straightforward as at representative elements. And so as you travel across a period and the nucleus is exerting more pull because the radius is smaller, electronegativity increases. So radii are smaller due to increased nuclear charge. 
So the periodic table of electronegativities looks like this. I like to point out that the baddest element on the periodic table is fluorine with the highest possible electronegativity of 4, and francium, way at the other end of the periodic table, has the lowest uh, electronegativity on the Pauling scale. So elements that need electrons to complete an energy level tend to have high electronegativities like the halogens, and elements that are more stable by losing um, electrons have low electronegativities, and I'll restate that noble gases do not have electronegativity. So here's what a graph looks like. Notice there are blank areas because that's where the noble gases will be. So as you move across a period, the electronegativity clearly increases. And the last trend is metallic character. The tendency to exhibit metallic properties tends to decrease from left to right as you move from metals to nonmetals, and it is the result of the other trends, and it increases down a group, again, a result of the other trends. So the most uh, non-metallic element or the least metallic would be up here where fluorine is and the most metallic element would be down here at the opposite corner where francium is. And I'm going to end with this uh, chart that's a summary of the properties and I will be handing you one of these out in class. This is Ms. Augustine signing off.